Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This is going to be episode, I don't know which number, because the last episode went for three hours, and it's probably going to be multiple episodes. So episode 30-something, uh, featuring my favorite 30-something, uh, Mr. Aaron Julian. He is the orchestra director at Graham Kapowson High School, where my brother was part of the first graduating class. Uh, great history of music at that school. Um, and I am so uh, proud of uh, the success that his students have had since he took over the program. So welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Hello, it's good to be here. So uh, we've got a little bit of a history. We, we have experienced some things together, to say the least. Um, I think maybe on the, the forefront of what we could talk about is how uh, moving forward and with the shared experiences we've had, can we open dialogue with administrators and maybe even legislators to make sure that music stays um, an important part of our daily breakfast, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Well, I know um, I've done a couple of, there's, a, there's this guy, Scott Lang, is the Scott Lang uh, Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. He's been doing these webinars pretty frequently about um, advocacy and, and recruitment. And he has uh, a thing that he just says a lot um, that is he's not interested or we shouldn't be interested in what is safe for students. We should direct our energy into what students need and make that safe. So it's still about having a safe experience, but instead of just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we evaluate, you know, what is it that draws kids to school? Because we all know that public education exists as, you know, a, a tool for, you know, society's wheels to keep moving, you know, Soci or the economy can't open until schools open, you know, 100%. So if we sort of take that into consideration, we have to figure out, okay, other than just needing to be there legally, why are kids going to school? And it's for sports and it's for the arts and it's for all these things that enrich us as people. So we just need to continue providing those services, providing those programs and make them safe. Well, uh, and a great example of, of that particular issue and the solution when you look at some of the the military bands out there uh and the military orchestras as well i think it was the army field band that i saw a post from because these are you know enlisted service people that if they decide they're going to get rid of the performing ensembles in the military they basically have to fire these people right right uh and they made, did a performance where everybody was pretty much in their own plexiglass cubicle. And I was having a conversation with some uh, colleagues yesterday about the price of plexiglass. Right. And the people who make that stuff are about to make a killing uh, because it's just about the only way uh, or one of the ways. And I, I suspect we're going to get creative and come up with ideas that, that I can't even fathom at the moment uh, that we could basically continue as usual. You got the whole, I for, forget which ensemble it was, everybody in their seats, and uh, distance wasn't so much a problem uh, because of the, you know, there's a barrier in between them uh, right. performing as usual. And, and maybe something as simple as just uh, ventilation in the classroom isn't so good, let's let the largest ensemble that period rehearse on stage. Mm -hmm. So if I've got my freshman orchestra of 50 more people um, and we've got to find a way to even on a split schedule where it's, you know, you're on a schedule, you're on B schedule. So now I've got 25 kids. Mm -hmm. We could rehearse on stage and space everybody out. And if we can get some plexiglass dividers and make it a little bit safer, um, we could, as you suggest, continue as normal, but make it safe. Right. And I know that in our in our own trenches, right, where we're all fighting the battle. Uh, everybody is already thinking proactively about how that's going to work. I mean, OSPI released its recommendations for safely returning to school uh, just a couple of days ago, 
and really the morning that our administrator talked to us about it in our morning meeting, the music teachers met right after and just immediately started the conversation, how are we gonna make this work? And a part of that was exactly like you were saying. So fourth and fifth period orchestra where I work meets on stage. Um, it makes way more sense for fourth and fifth period band to be on stage. One, because they're slightly larger ensembles, and two, because of the consideration that they're going to be using their air a lot more differently than we will be using. So really, with, without any politicking, without any budget requests, with, without anything like that, we, we immediately came up with one of our own solutions. Mm -hmm. So just and, like, continue having those conversations. Yes. And I think this is kind of the way that, you know, you treat like a, an open wound. You can't just slap one Band-Aid on it. Right. We're, we're going to have to work through these things and, and clean it out and redress the wound multiple times. And I think a, a lot of people are, for the right reasons, overreacting to some of the, uh, the statements by OSPI. Because you can, you know, parse out one little bit of information and really kind of feel like the sky is falling. But if you read through the whole thing and kind of take it um, on just on face value, uh, the whole thing itself is, is really kind of a temporary statement anyway. Because based on current information, this is what we suggest. Right. Uh, and with the goal being that we would re really like to see students return to the classroom uh, because nobody saw a ubiquitous uptick in the quality of learning. I think all of us saw some students who participated more in the online format, but I don't think we could say for certain that the quality of learning was improved, even for those kids that never participated but did uh, for the digital learning. And for the vast majority in my, in my case, it was less engagement. I didn't have those, you know, the the, the one-offs, the outliers that didn't participate, but now they did. I didn't have a lot of that, and um, I, I think those are just feel-good stories to help us kind of get through this rough patch. Uh, but the reality is, for the majority of students, the online learning uh, in any course of study, especially in music, uh, is not preferable to meeting in person. Right. So, like you say, how can we meet students' needs and do so safely? And, and we've already identified a couple of, of ways to do this. Um, I think orchestra, we're kind of lucky in that, yes, we need to breathe like any other human being, right. uh, but we don't need to breathe in such a way that would project uh, right. droplets uh, further than in any other circumstance. And then there's, there's also, I mean, the obvious solution that everybody is, is talking about and, and like you saying, uh, like you were saying, uh, worrying about, and, and that's masks. Now I'm lucky enough that to only teach at the high school level, the majority of kids that take my class want to be there and want to participate. So saying uh, to an older student and more engaged student, um, this is just a part of the game now guys, like, we wear masks. I feel like there's not going to be a whole lot of pushback from the clientele that I work with, right? From the students that sign up for my class. Mm -hmm. But like you say, in, in orchestra, we're, we're really lucky because it's not that much work to put on a mask and play a string instrument. Now, the next group that have a slightly harder time would obviously be choir. Um, does it affect the sound? Yes. Is that a reason to cancel choir? No. Uh, is it going to be uncomfortable for some kids? Yes. Is it going to be uncomfortable for the majority? Probably not as much as, you know, any kid would complain about having to stand in choir for an hour. So adding well, and, and that's what you made me think about with the, you know, yes, it's uncomfortable or, and there was a, you know, an online thread that we both kind of chimed in on and, and I did my best to prop up your voice of reason. Uh, but people were talking about getting kids to wear the masks. Well, just getting kids to sit in a chair. You ever taught middle school? For some kids, part of the kid, just yeah. getting the, and 
even the cello players where they have to sit to play there's always going to be a couple of kids that are going to fight the whatever the, the rules of engagement are so you come into orchestra one of the things that you have to do before we start unless you're doing a chamber orchestra thing or you're doing something silly where you have them stand up and spin around is you sit in a chair right and now we're just adding a temporary additional temporary additional you know requirement of you got to wear a mask and there's going to be the same kid that refused to sit in a chair well maybe not the same kid but there's going to be a contingent of children who will wear the masks incorrectly or not want to wear the mask or they say they don't have a mask and it's yeah that sucks it stinks it's gonna be a battle uh, but would you rather continue this online learning thing where you're maybe talking to three out of your 50 kids? Right. It goes back to, are you going to throw out the baby with the bathwater? I mean, that's just the analogy we have to use. Do we lower our expectations for in, in-person instruction because we're worried about those, yeah, those particular students with those particular issues? Or should we evolve as an institution and learn how to deal with those behaviors? Um, and that goes to hiring more counselors and hiring more supports and, and all that good stuff. But it's just, it's a part of our future and we have to dig in and use it to our advantage instead of uh, letting it defeat us. Now, I want to amend what I said about, uh, not amend, but maybe add to what I said about those students that um, like inquire uh, that maybe more than just being uncomfortable, obviously there will pe be people, again, referencing the Facebook post we were both reading, there's a lot of good points about maybe needing to read people's lips or they have reading and problems. And there's plenty of new, I mean, people have already solved that problem. Right. There and is in the OSB guidelines, face shield, and uh, a number of companies have started producing the see-through masks that are, are just as protective. Uh, so I, you've, you've said it already, that don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't let one hindrance uh, stop us from continuing to find a solution. So we know masks, um, to some degree, prevent the spread. And you can argue about how much or how necessary, but for sure it's better if everybody uses one. The same way that you can't have a peeing section in a public swimming pool. It only works if everybody does it. Everybody agrees. So um, it, sometimes we just need that innovation or the, the open-mindedness to consider that, okay, masks aren't going to work for my students because they need to see people's mouths to, you know, lip read or just um, maybe their communication is a little bit challenged. And so we need something out of the way so that we can see and hear what they're trying to say. Well, let's come up with a solution. And guess what? They, they already had one. Right. And it was um, something I was talking about with Bruce Walker yesterday. And this is just a, a life lesson that I have learned and try to pass on to my students is never make a permanent decision based on a temporary situation. So yesterday, I don't That's, know if you saw the news. Expect, that is wisdom right there, my friend. That, that, I love that. Thank you. You're I'm welcome. Gonna, remember that one. You can use that. That's yours now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the Nashville Symphony and the Shermerhorn uh, Center for the Arts decided they're going to close all the way through July of 21. But likely, uh, the, the, they say they furloughed their employees. Uh, but knowing Nashville as I do, I suspect they're just throwing in the towel altogether because they think there's no way we can make it through this. We, we're not going to provide any alternatives. It's not worth the effort. And whatever reasons that they, they actually have, I, I'm more of a kick the can down the road and kind of person. And let's, let's see what this thing looks like. Well, I'll say to, to that point in particular, using that as like a little bubble and our situation as a little bubble, you can reboot a symphony mm -hmm. with a like you can, the symphonies fold all the time and then they become reborn under new leadership with the same musicians, mm -hmm. right? The team didn't go anywhere. 
They just needed another place to be or another leadership model mm -hmm. or whatever. You, what we have to be wary of and advocate against or, or for or whatever is, is this, that same solution doesn't work in public education. Yes. Every time you collapse a program, it's 10 years out before it even approaches getting off the ground again. Well, and, and uh, as orchestra teachers, as music teachers, uh, this is something that we deal with with the counseling department all the time. And even the most helpful of counselors, uh, they see things from their perspective of, I've got a kid with a hole in their schedule and we've got to get them in a class or this class looks full. And they're understanding things from a, a homogenized perspective of what classes are is that it's a room with this many people allowed to be in it. Sure. Not necessarily thinking about the, I mean, cause OSBI, OSPI has different restrictions about how many kids in a room, depending on the class, especially when it applies to electives. Um, and if a, if a student leaves their instrumental music class, it's almost impossible to jump back on the ship, especially when you get into high school programs like you and I have, where there may or may not be a remedial course. Right. Like there's remedial everything else, uh, but not so much in music. I think uh, to some degree, there are a lot of times places in choir where there's room for an absolute beginner. For sure. And it, it's a steep learning curve if you want to get to, you know, really high levels of musicianship, but you can find a place if you have, you know, a non-auditioned y'all come uh, choral ensemble, but for something where muscle memory and musicianship are both required uh, and owning an instrument. I think we were talking about before we, we hit record, uh, what are you going to tell that student whose family has been renting an instrument for six or seven years and now, uh, there's not a spot for you in orchestra. Right. Uh, are they going to be willing to, even if there is a space for them to, to do the remedial work, like uh, when I was in high school, if a kid took a year off, they'd have to join in freshman orchestra the next year. Because that was, that was the, the space for them to sort of re-up their, their ability and, and get back on track. And if, you know, say that, uh, freshman year was the year they took off. By the time that they're juniors, they can be back in the group with everybody else. The same way that a, a re remedial math course is meant to get you back on track with your peer group. Um, but it, it's really dangerous to uh, come up with plans for the future uh, that are permanent changes to our temporary situation. So if if you limit every class, regardless of what subject it is, to 16 people, and we go on, you know, ABC schedule, well, even if we have three schedules uh, of, you know, at, in Port Angeles, we have a seven period day. So I've got six ensembles, and the freshman orchestra right now is at like, will eventually be at about 63. So even dividing that into three sections, it's still not at that 16 person limit. Right. So the, you know, five kids you cut or whatever, um, are they ever gonna be able to get back in? And, and, and then on top of that, in the arts and uh, I think also foreign language is experiencing the same pro problem as us and they do from time to time is that we depend on students coming up through the program in the, at the middle school level that continue all the way to senior year for our FTE, just to keep our jobs. Right. And that's not something that you know, any math or English teacher ever needs to worry about. So if, if you boot those five kids from my freshman group, what is the, the senior class in my symphonic orchestra gonna look like in three years? I, I totally agree that with, with no moral weight put into this statement at all, just as a statement of fact, that counselors and administrators 
just have not shared this, this experience that you are describing and had so much weight in terms of like their jobs, FTE, put into it. For example, exactly to your point, when I taught in my first couple of years, this little town called Chehalis, I was the five through 12 orchestra person. And what is sort of a, an out there idea for any other instructor that was my daily life is that if I recruit 50 kids into my fifth grade orchestra, that's, that's, my, that's my clientele for the next seven years. Yeah, you're not gonna get any more. I'm not gonna get any more than that 50, exactly. So I have to run the equation in my head as I lose kids, can it sustain the program as it moves on, right? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna lose them for any other reason other than they get busy life happens, they move, they start doing other things, like nothing catastrophic. Well, in the words of my predecessor, James Ray, there are some kids that were just never meant to be in orchestra for the, in the first place. And especially in Port Angeles, where every fourth grader can take orchestra, uh, their choices are the, the, I think it's general music slash choir or orchestra. And so the vast majority sign up for orchestra. But Realistically speaking, you've got band kids that are just kind of doing orchestra because orchestra is available first. Right. And we're giving them musical tools that will translate to band when they get there. And it, it has worked well in our district for a long time. Uh, but then you've got kids that are just there because of their friends or because they didn't particularly want to do choir. Um, that have no business being an orchestra and maybe they're going to damage an instrument or they're bringing the whole group down with their negative attitude and and I, I would take an ounce of positivity over a pound of talent any day and and there comes a point where we need to you know let the negativity go uh, but that doesn't mean that orchestra teachers are comfortable letting any student go because of that even the negative students when i was still in puyallup you know it it didn't matter how frustrating a kid was i knew if i wanted to keep you know the program alive i had to keep every kid i, yeah. I got really creative two years ago the seats that's right i walked into the sixth grade classrooms because at the time the junior high had the four sixth grade classes and i said anybody want to start orchestra this year? I thought maybe I'd get 10 kids. And I ended up with a class of like 78. And thankfully, the room was big enough to accommodate that. Um, but the, the kids who had been doing orchestra since fifth grade, the beginning of fifth grade, um, were not real happy <laughs> right. to be in the room with kids just starting. Right. And it was really difficult to try and bring all of those beginners up to a level where the, the current seventh graders, sixth, seventh graders, were having just as much fun and being equally challenged. Sure. But because of that choice, there's you know, a bubble coming through that will hopefully sustain that program. Uh, but like you say in the, your, your Chehalis example, uh, we can only really expect that number to go down over right. time. And, and to get back to the core of why I interjected, was some of those kids, it's okay that they move on. Sure. And I, I think our, our wish for any orchestra student is that when they continue in life, that they continue to appreciate music at a, a more fundamentally academic, uh, but also, you know, passionate level, that they have a, a closer connection to music. And to just the arts in general. Yeah, well, and to have some empathy and compassion with the people around them. Music is one of those rare things where like you or I can show up to a gig and we don't know anybody. We don't really have to know anybody or know anything about what they think or believe or their you know, preferences towards fast food joints or, you know. It, right, it, yeah, exactly. As long as we know that the notes on the page and how to manipulate our instruments and we've got a conductor that we can more or less follow, 
we can make a beautiful noise together as a team. And if, if we lose kids throughout the years or they finish high school and they don't continue with music, we've taught them that, right. that they can achieve you know, the, the end goal of any project uh, just on the basis of trusting their peers that everybody's going to show up and do the work and let's, let's get the rest. Yeah. Well, some, I mean, going back to talking about what kids need, mm -hmm. say, a speech I give to my students every year that I've ever been a teacher is always a, a speech that I say right before we go play in an assembly because a lot of kids have some fear about, because it's, it's a safe space to play for your family or for other musicians, but all of a sudden you're really thrown into the, the deep end when you're playing for just a huge pack of people who don't know you or care. Um, and I feel like the greater lesson to be taken from that, and this is something I tell them every year, is that we as people, every person, not just music people, but every person, we're all consumers. Mm -hmm. We consume art. We listen to music, we watch shows, we, we're always taking in. Mm -hmm. But it's something really, really special to be a creator. Mm. Putting something into the world. And there will be people who tell you that it's amazing. There will be people who ignore you completely. And there will be people who uh, are really negative towards what you have produced, your creation. But a part of this journey, being a musician, is to, is to share and to be brave enough to do something that so few people, I mean, worldwide, are brave enough to do. And that's really put themselves on the line to create something, to convey meaning with something, to, to not only just think that music is beautiful, but be brave enough to create beautiful music. Well, to, to move this conversation in a direction that I know you'll be in agreement with, Star Wars. So Boy. the the new trilogy, this, this is exactly what you're talking about. And the number eight in particular, mm -hmm. very, very negative feedback, right. ubiquitously. Right. But first and foremost, could you, as one individual who is negatively commenting on social media, produce anything close to that level of quality of a film. Right. And, and what expertise do you have as a Facebook troll uh, to really make any comment on the way that movies are made? Right, yeah. And my follow-up to whatever rebuttal there is, is would you have preferred they stopped making movies? No more Star Wars ever. We're, we're just done. If you, the audience doesn't seem to like it, so we're not making any more. I feel like that speaks to another amazing lesson that we can teach in music or in art or in theater or whatever, is that there is a difference between something being bad and you just not liking it. Yes. You are entitled to your opinion. And the more you know about a subject area, the more the deeper and more meaningful your opinion can be but your opinion does not is not a fact well i i love on this podcast to talk about how much i dislike the music of johannes brahms <laughs> i fair enough well and and it but it's not because it's bad and i say that every time right the there are things contrapuntally and harmonically that he does that very few composers have ever, will ever get close to. Uh, my issue is that when you have uh, your regular symphony going audience, or better yet, a class of a good demographic spread of high school students, if they went to a symphony concert where Brahms 4 was being played, mm -hmm. are there any melodies that they are going to leave humming and whistling? And my, my dear friend and colleague, Dan Davison, as he was uh, in one of the top selling choral composers on J.W. Pepper, as he was sort of counseling me on, on my composing and arranging, and I'd have him listen to a piece, he said, music needs to make you move or move you. And follow up, 
it's way easier to make you move. So if we're not making some kind of content that people can relate to, if it's not relatable, uh, that's, that's where we're gonna have problems. So if, um, even if a student, for example, uh, does not particularly care for a piece of music, if we can find a way to make it relatable for them, I think we can get buy-in, which is why we have a difficult time doing some of the music that you and I grew up with, uh, like the, the Bach Little G Minor Fugue used to be a really popular uh, orchestra tune. And there is a subset of kids that love to listen to that, but fundamentally it's not relatable for most kids. But uh, I mean, dial it back from high school, fifth grade orchestra students, have you ever had a kid or sixth grade or seventh grade, whenever you're doing this piece, that didn't like Dragon Hunter? Right. <laughs> I have high schoolers because we, we read it every year with younger groups that are so excited to play Dragon Hunter. <laughs> I, all I did a request day uh, with uh, juniors, sophomores, seniors, and top of the list was Gauntlet in every class. We want to do Gauntlet. I was like, you don't want to try Hoedown? You don't want to do the, 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 the Don Buren Serenade? No, we want to do Gauntlet. Gauntlet. Yes. Because they relate to Gauntlet. Right. Because it makes them move. Because it makes them move. Mm -hmm. And there are other pieces like Of Glory's Plumage or the Von Williams Rosa Midra that I think in the right setting with a well-prepared performance can move you. So if it's not doing one of those two things, uh, we need to reevaluate whether it's worth not just presenting to an audience, but putting in front of our kids. And I, I do feel like whenever, um, you know, I, I go into the catacombs of the music library and I see the things that uh, the, the, the school had purchased in the 80s or 90s, you can just open those scores and I can tell almost immediately yep. if kids would like it now. Mm -hmm. And again, with no moral weight to that, that sentiment. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying the kids now are, are dumber. I'm not saying that they have a shorter attention span. Like, it has nothing to do with that. I can just tell that a kid from 1984 probably enjoyed this. I mean, uh, clearly their teacher spent some money on it. And I just know that my students now would just not even know where to begin. Well, what is relatable is a reflection of our society. And I think with no moral weight, we have shorter attention spans. And so things that are slow are gonna be difficult. Things that are not rhythmic, they don't have a lot of percussive, you know, driving rhythmic qualities are going to be uninteresting to students. And things that are harmonically um, varied, to, to uh, an extent that isn't present in uh, radio or, or whatever digital media uh, people are consuming popular music, right. uh, it's, it's going to challenge their ear in a way that is uncomfortable. Whereas I think even in the 90s, you could get a kid to play an A flat because, hey, it makes this really cool chord. Because right. there, were, you know, th there were people on the radio uh, and, and even the hair bands of the 80s and, and into the 90s were doing some interesting things, harmonically speaking. But now, uh, you know, poker face. It's, it's not even a rhythm. It's rhythm. one note. Bop, 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 bop. Yeah. So we can't expect our kids to attach or relate to things immediately. That's not to say we can't push uh, something more, but they're not gonna relate uh, to anything outside of that. And but here's what's really interesting, especially in like exactly to your point about Poker Face, that um, when Frozen was huge, Frozen 1 was huge, however many years back, 
and let it go is just the biggest kids tune that had ever been recorded oh but you can't play it to save it it's it's so syncopated it's impossible well well here's the thing and this is my point about poker face is that when you put that sheet music in front of kids that love that music and then you ask them to play it it's syncopated or not it's mind numbing to them because of its repetition so why do they love it in this context and hate it in this context well it's just different when it's being played for them and they get to enjoy it and sing uh, yes. to it. But when you are playing poker face versus dancing to poker face, it's yeah, it's torture to just play that one note. Da, 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 da. Like there's nothing fun about that at all. So why does it work on the dance floor and not in the orchestra room? It's just, it's not so complicated. Well, and, and this is a conversation I've had with a couple of the composers I've had on this podcast is writing idiomatically is really, really important. Because like the, I, I've got the music from Frozen, Frozen on the shelf, uh, but every time I've tried it, it has not gone well. No, no. Because if you really think about it rhythmically, da 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 I mean, it's, it's all off the beat. The kids have no idea where to put it. Every now and again, there's a triplet that comes in. Right. Um, and, and sometimes you, you need to put it in front of the kids to get them to realize, well, let's play something else. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like w when I was in high school, it was always, can we play Viva La Vida? Right. Yes. That was. Me. And then we put it in the string quartet book and lo and behold, it's really, really hard. The, I mean, the, the rhythm, the, the chord changes, the harmonic rhythm, bump, 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 easy, fun, people love it. But then the melody, da, 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 it's very difficult for, I mean, even a good high school kid is not going to sight read that. No, and so there's the point of, what is the value for a student to learn that piece? Like if you're playing, if you're in a string quartet and someone's paying you to play Viva La Vida because it's their favorite song, that is your impetus for wanting to learn it, right? But if you're just going to play Viva La Vida just cause, just cause it's fun, and you have to spend all this time deciphering the rhythms, you have to spend all this time worrying about, um, your technique as the brain drain mm -hmm. of the rhythms and the pitch. It's like, it's such a huge journey for what payoff? Yes. For what payoff? And, and a, a moment of realization I had yesterday talking with Bruce Walker was that readable is not the same as easy. Like the readability of a piece is incredibly important, but a piece that is too easy is also not a good choice the way that a piece that is too hard is not a good choice right so it's really important that composers are writing music that is idiomatic to the instruments even if it's in a funny key where we're trying to uh achieve you know let our goal for this unit is uh playing in flat keys there there is an idiomatic way to introduce flats on string instruments uh, as opposed to piano or or uh, any wind instrument, and keys don't matter in choir because you can move it around, and only the kid with perfect pitch notices. Right. Um, or the pianist, if you're using a, a piano, and you probably don't want to do that to them. Uh, but again, they're getting paid. But they're getting paid. <laughs> uh, but a, a readable piece isn't always easy. Like the music of Rimsky Korsakov, or I don't know why, reads really easy on violin. Everything I've played Rimsky Korsakov reads really well. Now that's not to say that it isn't hard. Like there are bits in Skihi Rizade, which is the way that I say Scheherazade, because then I can remember how to spell it. <laughs> hey, I like that. That's good. I got that from Travis Cypher. I, I can't take credit for that one. All right. Uh, or uh, my favorite Rimsky Korsakov piece, the Russian Easter Overture. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much D major arpeggios in one position at a time. Mm. And so when it you you shift, but it's still you don't 
within that one idiomatic chunk, you don't have to shift inside of it. It's one hand position, right. which is idiomatic writing for strings. Go well, ahead. Well, um, what I was just going to say that to, to the idea of easy versus hard and what you're describing, because here, here's where it always breaks down for me when I have to do translating between a student and myself. Mm -hmm. is that kids will say we don't want to play this because it's too easy but what they really mean is that they don't like it mm. it doesn't interest them because i've put incredibly easy music in front of students that they have loved um and those same kids that are just like we need to play harder music we need to play harder music you put something that is difficult to read and is difficult to figure out on their instrument and then you shut down completely yeah. So it was never about difficulty. It was uh -huh. about, so what you're describing right here with, with Korsakov, that the thing you're doing may be simple, but because you love it and it's fun and it, in context, it's wonderful music. You don't mind that it's simple. Like you're still having a really good time playing arpeggios in one position at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, two, Two of the tunes that I did with my freshman at the beginning of the year, we read through at the Birch Bay workshop, um, Anti Meridian. I think that's a Kurt Mosier tune. No, Todd Parrish. Well, know. it's Anti Meridian and Arachnids. Arachnids Lair, I think, is Kurt Mosier, and Anti Meridian is Todd Parrish. But um, really easy, Re like stupidly easy. But they have just enough of syncopation and some like harmonic funkiness that the kids are into it. Because coming, this was my first year at the school. I had no idea what they were or weren't going to be able to do. Sure. Right. So I wanted to make sure that the music would be fun to play, easy to learn, and the audience would enjoy listening to it. Because- it's Accessible for everybody. Well, because uh, uh, fun to play and easy to learn are not always fun for the parents to hear. Right. Yeah. And I also had an, an extra motivation of putting something new on the stand so that parents who have had the fourth or fifth kid go through the program don't have to hear it again. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so that I wouldn't have to compare myself or invite the comparison with my two immediate and amazing predecessors, Ron Jones and James Ray. Right. But uh, anti-Meridian, uh, I wish I could remember who, I think it was Todd Paris, but I don't want to come into that. Uh, cello start out with this um, bump bump da da dum bump 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 ba da dum bump, and just that the kids are sold. Right. Because it's it's rhythmic, it's minor, and they don't have to shift to do it. But there's no. What I love about that story is that there's no science behind that. It just, <laughs> hap it just happened to be a riff that they were like, yes, we have decided this is we love this because the the piece that um that your orchestra played in puyallup at contest what is that uh, the oh steampunk steampunk right so the whole time your group is playing steampunk they're into it i'm into it i really enjoyed that piece and they for sure could have played it more in tune more accurately but they, what, and that's not what matters we're not talking about that yes yeah. we're just talking about like they were into it. I was into it because they were into it. Yes. So my point is, I'm so psyched about steampunk, right? I go back to um, school. I'm telling my kids about how a good <laughs> friend of mine's group played this piece. I'm so jazzed about it. Like, we're going to listen to it. And they are not sold. <laughs> really? They, they, don't, they don't get it. They don't understand why I like it. And the point I'm trying to make is that it just seemed like a slam dunk, but for whatever reason, for that year, for that group, for that moment, they were like, no, nah, not impressed. I can't imagine a group that wouldn't like steampunk. That blows my mind. But, that, but this is what I'm saying. Like, I, I, bet, I bet with that same group of kids six months later, if I played that piece, maybe it would be a different mm. role. Who knows? Again, there's no science to it. It just works or or it doesn't. I mean, they're just, well, again, going back to the fact that they're not getting paid to do this, they have to love it. Being a teacher, uh, there's two things that happen. 
Uh, one, you feel old all the time. Absolutely. And the follow-up to that, number two, is because they use words that you don't know what they mean. <laughs> like, I still feel like I'm relatively young, and if I have to look something up on Urban Dictionary, right. I feel great shame. Right, yes. But the a word I learned this year, uh, whether or not a piece would work for my kids, is the piece had to be slapping. Right, yes, that bop has to slap. It, so uh, the, the first hit that I had with the 10th or 12th grade Y'all Come group was a piece called Cascade by Burt Lagan. Because it starts out with this ba da ba 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 and the, the bass players get this like really kind of funky fresh it was slapping right or the Kurt Moser's red red Rimiko uh bum 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 yeah those pieces those Moser pieces this is exactly what we're talking he's a piano bass player so it like obviously he gets it he just knows what formula like he's he's got the bones and he's just gonna hang new music on it but the bones are just like grooves, grooves that kids love to play. And uh, to shamelessly uh, promote myself, if you go back through the playlist, Kurt Moser is in there like two or three episodes ago. So you can talk to us about all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff. Uh, more. No, but the, and the conversation I had with him was 100% the discussion we're having now right. about, uh, one, when he's invited to work with an orchestra, uh, they usually are commissioning him to write a piece too. And so he wants to know what kind of group is it? What, what's the numbers? Who's playing what? Uh, what kind of ability level? If you can give me a rough like grade estimate. Um, and then is there anything in particular about your region or your area or this group that I should consider when writing this piece? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I f forget, I think it was a group in Oklahoma. Uh, he wrote a piece um, where he incorporated this, like a, there was a, like, kind of a horse cowboy kind of theme. Okay. So there was lots of den diga den diga den diga den diga den rhythms, because that would be relatable to that group. Right. It would have and imagery it, for them. The, the and, it, and it's an exciting rhythm. Yeah. Uh, I think that the days of giving cello and bass just, you know, footballs is over. Right. Going back to what we were saying about music from the 80s and 90s, that just like when you look at those scores, it's exactly what you just said. They're providing uh, harmonic, like, structure, but their parts are interchangeable with, I mean, there's just no point to having them there other than a drone for the chord. Well, and if you spent any amount of time teaching from a library that it's just made up of that stuff, you'll notice really quickly that your first violins are getting excellent. Yes. Your second violins uh, are drooling. Your cello and bass players are probably on their cell phones most of the time. And the viola players are probably getting worse because right. they can't play all the CNF sharps. Right. Well, exactly to that point, I mean, we could get into it. But that's why it is my belief that your top players shouldn't just live in first violin land their whole career. Otherwise, yeah. and then we talk about the product that the audience gets. Like if you put all the lowest players into a particular section, and by lowest, I just mean less experienced or, or just whatever you want to, to do or however you want to do it. Um, you need strong players in every section. Because I think it's you who said to me once, there's, you can't buy a second violin. Mm -hmm. You buy a violin and you play a second violin part. But you should always be the best violinist you can be, playing whatever part you're playing. And a good amount of that is that from year one through senior year, the music needs to be as equitable as possible in difficulty to all of the instruments because the the idea of taking a kid who kind of isn't doing so hot on violin and giving him a bass because bass is easier right. oh. 
No, please, no. <laughs> he just made a, a bad bass player. Like, yeah. Every and, instrument should be represented by motivated uh, kids that, that want to sound excellent. And, and a bass part is not going to look like a first violin part, and I, I, I dare anybody to make that successful, to make a bass part look like the first violin part. Yeah. I think you'd have to make the first violin part look like a bass part first. Uh, but bass is the most important instrument in the orchestra. Right. If you want to sound in tune, you start with the basses. Or if in a string quartet setting, the cellos. Sure. You know, if you if you don't have a you know foundation to set your house on, you got nothing. Right. But then that goes back to again, uh, part writing in educational music and how that has changed. Because like we could look at Dragon Hunter. Okay. Let's use that as the gold standard of educational literature. Well, because it's really only two parts. But you look at the, here's the, here's my beef though. Okay. So if we're playing Dragon Hunter, we're probably, it's a pretty good first year group or a second year group that's doing it, right? Yeah. Who you're programming it for. So at that level, is the overall intonation of the ensemble going to be phenomenal by performance time? Not what matters. So if we take that into consideration, is it important that we have fully fleshed out harmonies the because it's a 90 second piece of music, right? So do we need to have a third in every chord? No. No. So why are the violas only playing one note for 90 seconds? Why are they only playing the third? Like if we just take for granted that um, the audience doesn't mind if it's a unison melody or a homophonic melody, why not give the violist, the viola part, just as challenging a part as first violin? If not the whole time, then for their 16 bars of it or, or whatever. Well, and, and I'm a cheater. I'll admit to it. When I do Dragon Hunter, I make the first violin part. I take the first out and I put it through Muse score and right. I change it to alto clef. Right. You so make all of the shoulders have the first violin part and all of the floors have the cello part. Yes. And you know, but, who and I don't start basses. Uh, you know who doesn't mind the audience? Yeah. They don't, they don't care. And all your kids are getting better. Well, and if this is really a first to second year group, you or somebody else is hopefully playing piano. I think that's important because the kids need to feel supported. And, and to some degree, you kind of, the kids don't need to play the thirds yet. Uh, but the audience might, might be tricked into believing the kids are playing all of the notes just sure. by that the fund of just the piano doing the bump argue that having all of the music there like piano or on string is not important but what i am arguing against is cultivating bad violists yes bad yes, yes, yes. Players, because you've never challenged them because all my brainiest kids play viola yeah but since they've never played a part that's challenged them, they're terrified of third position. They play these instruments that are too big for them. So like extensions on the C string and G string, like it always sounds bad. There's just so many disservices done to them. And same with bass players. Absolutely. I think the, I don't know why any kid shorter than five nine is playing on a three-quarter size. I mean, even Edgar Meyer plays on like, I think it's technically like a, a five-eighth size. Something like that, you know? Sorry, I lost you there. Oh, I was, I was just saying that uh, even Edgar Meyer plays on this like weird like five-eighth size bass. Like right, yeah, this tiny little bass, yeah. Like, unless you... Because the placement for bass is when your arm is not yet fully extended, should be about three quarter inch above the bridge. That's your your setup point. So, um, and, and every bass is kind of shaped different regardless of resonating length. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, I mean, if if this is a whole step or a whole step for you, I've got big hands. 
And I mean, that's like this pen's length. Mm -hmm. Are you going to expect every student to do that well? Well, let's, what if we could just get it to that? Right. So uh, getting a smaller instrument so that everybody can be more successful. And when you get the six, three kid, you know, bring out Mac daddy, you know, three quarter size bass. Right, right. But the same can be said of violas for sure. I don't know why there is this thing where um, all my violists are playing 15 inch and bigger instruments. I don't know if there are people at the music stores pushing these things or. Well, I, the case they're, they're not string people. They probably just learned the, can your hand fit around the end of the scroll? Uh, but they're not thinking, is that like that or like that? Should the fingers come all the way around or just like touch the end of the scroll? Right. Uh, and the, the same thing I was talking about with bass, the resonating length and body length or body shape uh, vary a lot on violas as they do on bass. Mm -hmm. And you can get a, a viola with, you know, a 15 inch resonating length, but the, the upper bout comes out so much more, uh, you know, around in front of where your hand is supposed to be. So mm -hmm. rather than be able to reach like this for the nose picking notes, your the body is keeping your pinky from and now you got to do this this whole elbow thing whole thing yeah it's painful to watch <laughs> and, painful, and painful to listen to <laughs> it's not their fault i don't know how many times as an educator i've thought i've had a con like i've thought something about a kid's playing mm -hmm. and then when i pick up their instrument to play it myself i'm like oh there's I get it, yeah. I get it. I, I, there's no way you would ever be able to play those notes. The instrument is not set up right. The, the strings are too close together or they're an inch off the fingerboard. Like, instruments matter. Instruments matter. Yes, they do. So I, I've got some just hip fire questions for you and then we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. All right. Uh, so you give a group a piece of music that you think is going to be slapping. Absolutely. And, and they're not buying it. Absolutely. Do you take it away immediately or how hard do you push? It is entirely dependent upon the group, in my opinion. For my freshman group, I generally, whether or not we are playing um, something for performance or just something for skill building or sight reading, I always try and find something that's going to be educational. Mm -hmm or I find something that I know they're going to love based on their you know, group character and then make it more difficult by arranging a part or, or writing in fingerings or we talk about how we're gonna play this section in third position or, or whatever. So we can take something that may be for eighth grade and give them a reason to, to, to learn it, right? That you can take that, um, oh no, I'm gonna, brain spaz on the guy's name uh he does all the like the bach uh stakowski not stakowski no the the educational composer who has all those really oh, good uh merle merle j isaac isaac right that like you can take brandenburg three and play so much of it in third position like you you've done something with a very simple arrangement that gets them better anyway so to your point for younger kids where I need to teach them skills, playing and theory skills, it's all about getting them psyched about orchestra, all about keeping them in orchestra. For the middle group, I kind of take that to the extreme. Those are the kids that, for the most part, love being in orchestra, but are not there to get great at their instrument. Mm. They like playing their instrument, and they love being together as a group. But like every moment they're in orchestra is the only time of the day they're going to touch their instrument. So I know in that middle group, there are kids that want to practice hard and will eventually be in chamber orchestra. And those kids deserve instruction. But I, I reserve uh, technique time for those kinds of things. Then we get into repertoire and it's just stuff that kids that really want to play. And then for chamber, I do feel like that is where I have made a decision based on our playing ability, uh, based on performances we have coming up. Um, and this is the repertoire that we're gonna play. It's gonna <laughs> highlight us well, it's gonna teach you a lot of stuff. 
and there is artistic merit in the literature. I mean, even when we were getting ready to play at the convention this year, um, I chose three tunes and the, the opener was going to be uh, uh, an arrangement of Bernstein's Denzon that I thought was just a really great opener and taught them a lot of stuff. Like it was not easy for them and they really didn't enjoy it. And as by the time we were getting close to convention, kids were suggesting like, can't we replace that tune with something else? And they all had really good reasons and really good suggestions. But the fact of the matter was like, if I am going to adequately prepare you kids who have chosen to audition, who have chosen to hold themselves to a higher standard, if I'm going to run this ensemble like I'm preparing you for a real world experience, oh, yeah. experience, playing the stuff that gets handed to you, exactly like you were saying earlier, like you don't have to like the music or the people or the anything, like you just have to do a great job of conveying beauty with whatever gets handed to you. Well, in any interview with any professional musician, the question comes up, what's your favorite piece of music? What's your favorite concerto, favorite composer? And pretty ubiquitously, the answer is whatever I'm working on right now. Right, yeah. Because that is the only way as a professional in music that you can keep your sanity. Right. Is that you have to fall in love with music not a composer, not a piece. And to keep getting callbacks. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> if you want a job, you have to play every piece of music like it's your favorite piece. Well, and, and we have to change what it is that we love. Do we just love, you know, playing fast songs in D major? Right. Or, do we, or do we love to practice our bow hold? Because if we can learn how to love, how to practice, you know, playing C natural, then that opens up the whole library of, of opportunities for repertoire, if we can learn to love to practice. Right. So uh, next hip fire question, a uh, counselor tells you uh, that there's a kid who's just gonna try out orchestra this semester. <laughs> and uh, you have done everything in your power to mitigate the situation, right. uh, but this student is now in your class. Mm -hmm. And regardless of their enthusiasm, what do you do? So I have had this, and in my experience, it is a 50-50 shot. <laughs> Either they are going to hate everything about it because they're so far behind, or not only do they catch up, they surpass. Like, sometimes. I have, I have, sometimes, and I'm just saying that like, but in my experience, it really is. It's either one or the other. So sorry, I'll amend my statement. It's not a 50-50 shot. It's just A or B. It's just up or down. It's either total success or epic train wreck. Yes. So that's where you as an educator have to think to yourself, is it going to hold anyone else back to have this kid making bad sounds in the very back row? Maybe, maybe not. Do I need to beef up my numbers to justify my existence and justify this ensemble's existence? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so my experience has always been to let kids in mm -hmm. and then sort of do damage control from there. Well, and, and th you bring up a point that the orchestra world is unwilling to tackle or in a lot of you know, financial situations unable to tackle because of FTE restrictions on, on our, our positions. Right. Uh, but a lot of times at the junior high level, there's a beginning band. Yeah. A freshman or eighth grader, if you're in a middle school, uh, could, could join band for the first time that year. Right. Uh, and l I was talking about it earlier, there's usually a starting point for choir in high school to catch kids who might be interested or, uh, their best friend or maybe their girlfriend boyfriend is in choir and somehow they've been coerced well can i can i pop something right into that statement that I, I am in no way saying that choir is easier okay that is because i have the utmost respect especially working with the choir directors i do at gk that excellent teaching makes excellent music but i will say this the amount of times i've heard oh my gosh, so-and-so has such a beautiful voice, but they've never done choir. 
whereas I have never heard, oh my gosh, <laughs> so it's such beautiful violin tone, but they've never been an orchestra. They can't read a lick of music. Like I've never heard that second statement. And as somebody with a choral degree who sang in the Choir of the West at PLU, the same choir that, that your choral colleague Jason Saunders sang in when he was at PLU, um, and it not an easy group to get into. I think at, at the highest level, any instrument is equally difficult. Absolutely. At the highest level. But we're talking about beginners that just float on in. But choir starts with an advantage of if you can walk, you can run. If you can talk, you can sing. Doesn't always mean you can sing well. No, no. But excellent, excellent music educators create excellent musicians. Absolutely. Most of the time. Uh, so if, if you've got a good voice and you've got a teacher who knows how to teach the theory and maybe your starting point is movable dough solfege and there's no shame in that, it's a great teaching tool, uh, but you can't do that the same way with a bassoon or with a cello. And because of how choir works, it has always been my experience that um, they have enough ensembles because mm. again, it's it's sort of you don't have to rent an instrument. You can start from scratch. You know, um, they have enough ensembles that they have a group where kids can begin. And if they have a beautiful untrained voice, they can do a little bit of catch up and learn the theory and learn yeah. how, to, how to refine their instrument. Um, but but to your point, like there's very often not a beginning orchestra class and in middle school or high school. And I, I won't put words in your mouth, but I think a lot of us wouldn't mind having a space for that. Oh, absolutely. There's some people that would poo-poo the idea, but if I had a class that was either remedial, uh, or it would it'd have to be a combination to be large enough. Right. So the remedial, and we're going to play Dragon Hunter and Gauntlet all day and have fun, plus beginners. Right. So you were out of orchestra for a year, you want to get back in, because to go on our every four, once every four year Carnegie Hall trip, you have to have been an orchestra the previous year and the current year. Mm -hmm. So if you got out and you want back in because you want to go on the Carnegie trip, well, I, I don't feel comfortable putting you in with my symphonic orchestra where we're playing the original hoedown arrangement. Right. Stuff that you won't even know how to start. But I do want to include you. And I feel like I can get you up to you know, the bare minimum, if you're willing to do the work, if I had a, if, if I had a space to place you. So uh, I, I think anybody watching this video who's an administrator or a teacher in a position of power, I think that could be a solution to some of the bubbles that are going to be coming up through uh, the classes of lower enrollment in, in, in bubbles. Like I say, sometimes the bubbles pop. And uh, we could recapture those students if we had that remedial space to do it. Well, I've encouraged all of my orchestra colleagues that especially this year and probably next year, you shouldn't be only thinking about retention. That the game is usually in people's minds, like just great the kids. Yeah. Fifth grade teachers recruit, I retain. No, I think that if you're a middle school teacher this coming year, and I don't care where you teach, you need to be getting as many kids into your classroom as can. And you just sell it like, did you miss the boat last year? Did you miss signups last year? And things have changed for you this year? We'll take you. It's not too late. And I'll be doing the same thing at the high school. Like, did you stop playing your eighth grade year? And, and you know, maybe you regret it or maybe you want to try it again. Uh -huh. Come back. Like, I like to recruit you back. The last year that I taught elementary, I, I noticed a bunch of first year kids that had not re-upped. And so I told the sixth graders, if we can get 25 more students, I don't care if they've never played before, uh, it'd be great if we got some people back. If we can get to 25, I'll buy everybody pizza. It's as simple as that. No, bet you got 25, right? We didn't quite get to 25, but I got people into that classroom that I didn't have before. Right. right. And when every kid matters towards your FTE, you'll take it. I'll take it. And we did good work and we have fun. 
Uh, and I am like you, I'm thinking about that it's not just retention because if you have any brains at all, when uh, we listen to you say that, well, I started with these 50 kids and the number's only gonna go down. Right. What's the answer to that problem? We need to create new situations for recruitment because there's more than 50 people in the school. And maybe, maybe we got 80 of them in band and maybe we got uh, 60 in choir. So, you know, add that 50 to the 60 and 80. So we got 190. Is that your whole high school population? Right. No. I mean, even in a 2A high school, you, you've, you've probably got <laughs> another 600 kids to draw from. Right. So uh, in all of the, the realms of music that I have taught, and I did a short stint in band, and I have the, the choral degree, and I started out doing the, the choir orchestra combo. Kids come for their friends, or they, they came for other reasons, but they stay for their friends, or rarer that they come for their friends and stay for the music. Uh, hopefully everybody loves the music, but the sense of community, by and large, is what keeps kids in their group. Yep. Uh, so my, my last hit fire question for you is how can any music educator with any group of kids do better to create a strong and interdependent community in their classroom? I honestly believe because the thing that I struggle with the most is wasting time. And what I consider wasting time is like when we are not engaged in either playing or learning some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sounds like it's, it's one of those interview questions like, tell us a weakness, but make it a strength. Like, I'm not trying to sell it like that, okay? I'm, just saying, yeah. I'm, saying, I'm saying it's straight up a weakness because exactly to your point, kids are there because they want a team, they want a community, they want their friends, and there's nothing wrong with that. So if you are not, if you are afraid, like me, of wasting time, Sorry, I, just, I got disconnected again. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, if you're afraid of wasting time is the last thing I heard you if say. If you're afraid of, waste, of wasting time, then you need to be intentional about building in time, either outside the, the, the classroom period, or just making this, just staying to yourself. Today, we're going to spend 10 to 15 minutes on team building exercises or just games and fun things. And it won't be a waste of time because I was intentional about building into my schedule. I was intentional about maximizing all the instruction I'll do on either end of it. And I'm not going to view this as a waste of time. I'm going to view this as an investment into my program's culture. Because if you do not make those investments into your program's culture, then especially, I mean, the thread of this entire conversation is going into next year when things are gonna be very difficult for all of us for any number of reasons. If you haven't already, you need to start investing in a culture so that there's a reason for kids to come back to you. Yes. Because if they think, well, if we're gonna do online learning for the most part, online learning doesn't work for me for orchestra. That's not why I signed up. I guess I'm gonna leave. Like you can hardly blame them if you're not giving them something really moving to come back to. And something that I started doing a long time ago and have reintegrated in maybe a, a more thoughtful way, something I call compliment chain. Okay. So uh, a lot of teachers, you know, use the, the popsicle sticks with everybody's name to make sure that everybody has been called on it, you know, throughout the week or whatever. Sure. And there's argument about, do you put the stick back in the can or leave it out? 
Um, and I, I think best practice these days is to leave it in the can so that the kid doesn't check out because they know there's a possibility they could be called on. Uh, but compliment chain is that I ask you to give someone else a compliment. And you get to choose. But the rule is that you cannot compliment someone who has already been complimented. And uh, on Thursdays on our, uh, our schedule here at Port Angeles High School, we have uh, 90 minute uh, classes. Mm -hmm. And it's just the y'all come group that, that day. So it's, I have three sections of symphonic orchestra, uh, about 30 kids each. Uh, and so we go through and if in the course of a month, there are kids that haven't been gotten to. I'll just let compliment chain keep going until I know everybody's gotten the compliment. And one particular day, uh, it, I usually give them a five minute break in those nine, 90 minute periods just because it's, it's so long to go. Oh, sure. No, yeah. So we work really hard on like on one thing for 45 minutes and then get a break. And like you say, uh, not being afraid of wasting time to giving that up in order to facilitate bonding and uh, building community. Uh, when we come back from our break is when we do compliment chain. Right. So uh, break was ending and I was about to start compliment chain and I was talking to a student about who's about to go play uh, in one of the nursing homes. Uh, one of the cool things about being in a small town is when they need music for something, they ask me. And that's really cool. And so I was getting a, a student and her friend ready to go play in a nursing home with, uh, you know, one of the easy duets for insert instrument books. Yeah. Uh, and right before I start compliment chain, I noticed the assistant principal is standing in the back of the room, mm -hmm. and I think to myself, "Oh crap!" Because this is this is going to come across as you wasting a colossal amount of time. He's going to see me wasting time. Right. And so I did compliment chain anyway, because I was like, you know, if I can't stand by my principles and principles, not principals, then you really are just wasting time. Then, then I'm really, so let's, let's see how this goes and let's see what the reaction is. Uh, Cause worst case scenario, uh, the assistant principal is going to tell me, you know, that's not really best practice. I want to see you, you know, and hard conversation to have, uh, but eh, it happens sometimes. Sure. Uh, but we, we go through, and I got to some of those kids that aren't so frequently uh, given a compliment. It, it just happened to be that day, uh, and I have built the, the expectation that it's not just, I like your hair. Sure, right. It's got to be a little more personal. And so I think the compliments were like, I really appreciate that every day when you come to class, uh, you say hello to me and you greet me. And then the next compliment, who, and the person who has been complimented, and it, this is especially fun if it's the shy kid that doesn't get a lot of compliments because they're not very social, then they have to compliment somebody else. And their answers are almost always the, the most fun, like the warm and fuzzies, because yeah. uh, you find out what they've been observing. Because those... Yeah quiet viola players, I don't mean to stereotype, uh, are deep thinkers. Yes. And so you hear things like, three weeks ago, I noticed in math uh, that you were late to class, uh, but I saw when I was walking to class that it was because you were helping a kid who dropped their backpack. And so we're reinforcing new social norms to change the paradigm of the whole school. Because right. high schools can kind of have some toxic culture. Yes, they and can. if we can practice new social norms, which exist only because we accept them. And celebrate them. And we celebrate them. Celebrate them. Then we can, we can change the culture. And so we get done with the uh, compa chain. And I say, okay, everybody take out Von Williams. Uh, we got to start playing. Uh, because I, I have learned, don't take yourself too seriously when a principal walks in the room. Just, Just do, do your thing. And if they're... a they see something wrong, they're going to tell you later. So just keep going. Um, and they don't normally say anything. They usually, you know, walk in, walk out. I'm sure you've had this experience many times. Yeah. So she very politely says, excuse me, Mr. Rodol, may I say something to the class? 
like since I came to this school, this is the most powerful thing that I have seen. As the, the person who does a lot of the discipline in this school, yep. I see a lot of negativity between people. I see people who only want to say bad things about each other. And this is the way I want my school to look. And, and that's not, I have no, this is not me. The kids were saying the things. I facilitated the environment for this to happen. Um, and if we can get over the wasting time, because though the kids that were in the room when that happened and had that reinforcement from somebody that maybe some of the kids in the room were afraid to see in the room. Right, yes. Because this is the disciplined person. Yes. To hear them praise us for celebrating each other. Built that community. And if I had decided, oh, principal's here, let's start playing. Wouldn't have happened. Right. And so you got to sacrifice some of that time to allow the social growth. And I wouldn't call it sacrifice. I, I would change, your, change it and say, we have to invest. We have to invest that time. Yes, invest time. And, and like you were you're saying about the kids in the room who are probably not going to go home practice, we've, we've talked about this personally before. I make the assumption that no one practices. Absolutely. Uh, because I have been in too many community orchestras where I maybe played 20 minutes out of the two and a half hour rehearsal. And I know how many people in those groups are not practicing. Right. So if we go two and a half hours and the second violins have only played 20 minutes and you get to the dress rehearsal and you're mad at the second violins, <laughs> I think you need to change uh, who you're upset with. Right. So it's, we play every day we play as much as we can. Right. And we, we don't throw any kid under the coals for playing C sharp again right. <laughs> i mean may i've got the relationship with some of the kids where it's like when it's the 10th day of playing you're the only one playing c sharp right. you, can, you can keep going and it's like why are you still playing c sharp <laughs> why are you doing this to me <laughs> and you can make it fun you can make it and there are kids that you don't do that with yes and that's where you say violas i really need everybody to play c sharp <laughs> Can we all hold our C sharps together, please? And and this is, I don't know if it's a Joe Divick thing, but it's a thing that I have seen Joe Divick do just about every time I've seen him teach, including when I was in his orchestras. Right. Okay, all violas hold the C sharp, and it's the one kid not doing it. All right. Okay, all violas. Not yet. I'll wait. And you'll see the kids turn on each other. Right. <laughs> like. <laughs> Adam, <laughs> right, yes, it's you. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a story that I tell my own students all the time that I went to go observe Joe, and like it was the class, it was the example of what you're talking about. How maybe a teacher, when there's a guest in the room, they change things up how they behave. I could very much tell that Joe changed nothing because I was <laughs> yeah. he, he was not there to impress me. He's That's no shame about the way he does things. Okay. Because we were in the uh, non-audition large group, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, we spent, they spent five, no, it might have been closer to like eight minutes maybe. Oh, you're talking about tuning? Tuning. <laughs> yeah. And just like, he wouldn't relent. He didn't walk over and fix anybody's thing for them. Like, he just let them be in this uncomfortable zone of like, like you were saying, like, everybody's looking because they want it to be over so they're looking around they're getting engaged they're helping each other they're saying like dude you have to go down <laughs> like you have to come up so hey, it Derek, just, get it together yeah exactly <laughs> so it's really i don't know i loved being a part of that moment and well so I my kids. and uh, maybe this is because joe is a bass player and, and similarly his colleague travis cypher that i have also seen tune this way i start with the basses yeah, two well, yeah. bases first, one by one. Uh, and every time I've come into a new position, I get the kickback from the kids. Why don't we tune from the concert master? 
well, that's, we, that's a ceremony we do in a concert, but we've already tuned in the student center or the, the whatever warm up. We've already tuned. Right. On stage is to confirm that you're already in tune. Right. So the concert master thing is, is a ceremony where we confirm that we're already in tune. Right. But when we are make, tuning, making sure that everybody's tuning, it makes fundamental harmonic sense to start with the basses. Because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of the rehearsal, for the rest of the piece. And that's the way the harmonic series works. Right. Everything is built on the fundamental pitch. And if they keep fighting me on it, I say, okay, get out your timer, on, get a stopwatch going, and let's see how, much, how, how long it takes to tune my way. And then tomorrow we'll do it from the violins. And so we do it my way, and it, yeah, like 90 seconds. You know, if, if you're doing a good job and the, the kids are used to the routine, it could, like two minutes, you can do it and do it well. And then the next day, we, I say, I get the concert master in tune and I have them provide an A and then it just everybody just tunes from that, tunes everything from that because that's what they expect because that's what they've seen in concerts. Sure. And then uh, I let keep the stopwatch going. I say, okay, let's check to see if that worked. Right, uh, yeah, let's do some. Let's everybody, everybody play your open A. Oh, can I hear the basses? Right. And then you, you just wait. And then cellos, and then violas, and then violins. And then you go through all the other strings. And guess what? It takes like nine minutes to do it that way. But when we start with basses and then basses continue playing, add cellos. And then cello bass keeps playing, add viola on just A. Because then you were joining the correct pitch right. rather than trying to fight all of the wrong pitches around you. Right. For that 10 seconds of aural memory of the correct pitch before everyone started playing. Well, in adding one at a time and then attacking the next string one at a time while everyone else keeps playing the last note, you're teaching the kids to hear the fourths and fifths right. yeah. that we tune our strings to. Yeah. So that when they are on their own and they just hear the, the one tuning pitch, they can do it better. Right. Uh, and, and it's as much as we need to invest in allowing certain things to take more time, we can also be more efficient. Exactly. And just teach better skills. And, and not be afraid to experiment with a new practice. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was not a comfortable thing to switch to tuning the way that I do now. Right. Because we all, at least those of us who grew up in an orchestra tradition, expect Concert master plays the A, everybody does it right. And if you didn't do it right, it's your fault. Well, there's, there's sort of this uh, prevailing expectation that we should hold students to this, like what you were saying, this, uh, this kind of like the theater of having the concert master stand up, play an A and da, 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 da. So something that professionals do, but I'm sorry, if we, if kids were capable of doing everything that a professional does well, they wouldn't need us at all. So we have to come up with different strategies to get them better. Well, uh, I once got feedback at uh, an adjudication uh, that I should have tuned the basses off stage because we, we got on stage and I just said, can I hear everybody's A? I mean, cause you're moving 109 people on stage. Things are going to go wonky. So I just want to check just real quick. Let's, and so the basses needed some adjustment. So I just went one by one and I made sure we were right before we started. Cause I was not going to start playing at an adjudication. Knowing you were out of tune. Knowing I was not. And the feedback was you should have tuned the basses off stage. And so I, I, I sought out this adjudicator and I asked, okay, so you're in my shoes, the blue sparkly shoes for the record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're in my blue sparkly shoes. You get on stage, you hear the A. Um, and the bases are out of tune, how would have you handled that situation differently? Right. It was kind of a... When definitely the answer is... You like 
all things in life, you take it as it happens and you do the best as you can. And fixing a kid on stage is 100% always there. And I, t I tell kids before every show, someone's instrument could go completely out of tune. Your string could go completely off. Don't be too embarrassed to, after the piece is done, bring me your instrument. Because I guarantee your section members, the orchestra, the audience will all appreciate losing a little bit of time to get it right and sound better. I was guest conducting the Olympia Chamber Orchestra. We were about to start playing our uh, second or third piece on the program. And one of the second violins, their bridge goes and they cut freeze. Right. And everybody else is like, oh, crap. Yeah. So I get off the podium, I jump over, and I, because I've got some luthier training and I happen to also be an orchestra teacher. And I fix it and I tune it and I give it back. And I wasn't about to just start without them. And if, if I happened to be a wind person, I, I probably would have looked to another string player and it's like, can you help me out, please? Yes. We got a situation. But you're not just going to like, you know, <laughs> if you're a parent of five, you're <laughs> not going to drive away with only four in the car. Because one of them couldn't get their shoelace. You do the count. You, you do the count. <laughs> you do that. Head count. <laughs> Yes. And make sure that one of them wasn't switched with the sack of potatoes. Right. You never know. <laughs> well, my, my final question that I ask of all of my uh, guests is, looking back on your career in music, mm -hmm. or, or even back into your, your days in middle school, high school, if there were a particular moment where you were struggling or experiencing a challenge in life, uh, what would you go back and tell your past self to be better equipped to handle it or make different choices? I think that looking back at um, just sort of my coachability, because something that I didn't appreciate as a student that I now think the world of, so going back to the very beginning of this interview, when you said, I'll take an ounce of positivity over a pound of talent. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. I, was a, I, <laughs> I was an ounce of talent with zero positivity. <laughs> a lot of times. And then I had this mentality that I had a pound of talent, right? Mm -hmm. So just this idea that if I could, because it's become my goal now as a teacher, I wish that I had just learned the lesson sooner, that humility and um, positivity are huge in terms of friendships and relationships. And whatever, your, whatever goal you're using music as a vehicle to get to, being better people should be the destination. Mm. And if I could go back and convince myself to be a better person earlier in the game, yes, not only would that like selfishly have opened a lot of doors for myself as just a younger person, but it, it would have just enriched other people's experiences too, to not be hanging out with a brat all the time. Well, and the, the way that we develop as humans is, is like the, that flex seal meme where the, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, the flex seal meme is undeserved confidence to cover up insecurity. Yes. Yes. Right. And there's, a, and we all have that, like, I'll go out on a limb and saying that your undeserved image of uh, talent right. was to probably cover up some insecurity about a lack of experience or, or something to that extent or a lack of humility or compassion or, or whatever it happened to be that we we have this flexial slap on whatever the real problem is that my worth is how how much talent i lend to this ensemble so however i act you need me because i'm holding us all together uh, yeah and and 
It doesn't mean that we're going to change ourselves overnight because that's hard work. Yeah. But I, I, for myself, I got to own up more frequently to that I do not appear socially, externally as humble as I see myself or the way that I look at the people around me in the field of orchestra. Uh, I mean, in my own schema, I don't think I'm doing a better job than anybody else. But the way that I walk on stage with my blue sparkly shoes and the, as Ryan Dudenbostel says, the big blue beast, right. I mean, you could get the impression that I am totally full of poo-poo. Uh, and, and I got to do better to own that perception. It doesn't mean that that's the way that I really am deep down in my core. Uh, Cause like I just admitted for everybody to is my false sense of confidence is to cover up my own in insecurity. So when I'm laying in bed at night, I'm not thinking I am so great. How grand. Oh, wow. Thinking. I am the orchestra teacher at Port Angeles high school. I am so great. No, I'm thinking, Oh, did that, did my third chair first violin get offended today when I was talking about intonation? Mm -hmm. Do any of the bass players like me? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's really what's going on. And, um, and as teachers being vulnerable with each other and with our students uh, could help make some, some changes in the, the social norm. For sure. Um, anything else that you want to say to our, our students or teachers watching this? Just that I keep trying to mute myself because my own children are losing their minds out in the hall. So what I'll say is specifically about um, just being, uh, having to do all of this that we're doing remotely in the comfort of our own homes, that I would love <laughs> to- I would love my office to, in an empty orchestra room. <laughs> right, I would love to end with this. And it goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning that what is happening to us is uh, temporary. And so not to make permanent decisions or even put the weight on your own shoulders of feeling like, oh, because trimester three of, the, of 2020 was so terrible, I'm a terrible teacher. No, we're, we're gonna come out of this. We're all experiencing this together we're all going to rebuild together. So whatever um, fits and starts and discomfort and negativity you felt as a student or as a parent or as an educator through all of this, you, you just have to let it go and be thinking about the future. If we start in person or remotely, we just have to accept that at some point we're going to get back to normal, hopefully a much better version of normal, because there's a lot of things that this whole closure has exposed about our system and our society that we need to fix. But, uh, but we have to be looking hopefully towards the future. We just have to. Well, it, you've got to think about it like being stranded in the middle of the ocean. You have this nightmare and you wake up in the middle of water. Do you start swimming or do you stop and drown? Exactly. And so we have to tread water until we get to the other side, because it is there. Right. I think we're just in a place where we can't see the other, the other end of the tunnel. Uh, and if we stop and sit, we for sure will not see the light at the end of the tunnel. We've got to keep swimming to the other end. Just like Dory says, just keep just swimming. Just keep swimming. <laughs> and there is no better way that we could end this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, awesome. Just keep swimming. Thank you so much, Aaron. I've got a couple more questions as soon as I hit uh, stop on the record here, but okay. thank you so much. And on behalf of all the students and teachers that watch this, uh, we appreciate your time and uh, appreciate your, your kids waiting patiently. Because <laughs> uh, it, it didn't come through the audio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, you've got two great kids and uh, I, I hope you're as proud of them as you are of your, your students. Because they're uh, of course I am, of course. both fantastic uh, groups of people. Uh, so thank you, and, and I, I hope to see you soon. Yeah, take care.